Good evening, church, <laughs> and Merry Christmas to you. It's so good uh, to be together. As I drove over, I was thinking, yes, I know that we still have issues with COVID, but do you remember what we did last year? It wasn't this, <laughs> right? We were on Zoom. So it's, um, it's really nice to be together. Um, and we're going to uh, begin with, uh, with a video and song by uh, Faith Hill to get us in the, in the spirit of the evening. Lord, a baby changes everything. And I know that that's true for every baby, changes the lives of, of everyone around them, brings joy and new concerns as well as uh, wonders and, and happiness. Lord, this baby changed everything. And we're so grateful that we have the opportunity to gather tonight and remember that the God who shaped the universe, who spoke it with a word from his mouth, has come into the world change our hearts, to change what this world has uh, struggled with, and to wipe away sin and death, and eventually every tear from our eyes. Be with us this night, O oh God. Amen. Amen. Jim and Helen, Mary Helen, to come up and uh, light our Advent wreath. <laughs> and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands, bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Luke 2, 7. On the holy night of Christmas, we celebrate the birth of Mary's Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In this moment, when the first cries of the Christ child pierce the cool night air of his humble circumstances, we realize that what we have been waiting for has been waiting for us all along. In this time of waiting, we were already living in God's presence. In the anticipation, we were already filled with God's glory. God has always been with us. And yet, the way that God is with us now is new and special. Wrapped in cloth, laid in straw, in the words of St. John, this is the one we have heard, we have seen with our eyes, we have looked at and touched with our hands. No one can take these beautiful moments from us. We kneel before him in awe. Our hearts are full of his light and presence. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Emmanuel, you are the firstborn son of Mary and the eternal word of God. Fill us with the joy of your presence always, 
May this Christmas be a fresh celebration of that ancient belief. You, O oh God, are with us. Amen. ask you to do a little singing and uh, oh you can you can remain seated um, during this we're gonna sing uh, a little town of Bethlehem <laughs> to do some juggling back there in order to do it, so <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> Thanks to their parents for uh, for uh, getting that done. That was just a few hours ago that uh, they told me and got the video and this and that. So, and now a scripture reading from John chapter one, verses one through fourteen. It's a very different kind of a Christmas story than the other gospels tell. It's a uh, Kind of an explanation of who Jesus was and how he's affected the world. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
Amen. Um, okay, and now we're going to have you sing again. <laughs>
Let's go to prayer. Lord, I, I thank you for the words of that song, and I kept hearing that line that, that says, breath of heaven, hold me together. And Lord, we have <laughs> had a lot of things to tear us apart, individually, as a church, as a nation. Lord, I, I just pray that your spirit would be drawing your people together to help us to remember that we are to be the children of the Prince of Peace, that we be peacemakers, that we, that we seek not only your grace and love for ourselves, but so that we can pass it on to others so that our lives and hearts would demonstrate the love that you have demonstrated to us. Lord, I pray for each one who's here that they would know the joy of your light and life, the joy of your presence in their lives and hearts, that you would bless each one as they head towards family and different gatherings. Lord, even amidst all the things that we do uh, tonight and tomorrow and, uh, and on and on, Lord, that the knowledge that you're with us would, would cut through all of that, that we would have a deep awareness of that in all that we do. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Scripture reading from Isaiah chapter 9. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, why, yes, we are. <laughs> Just seeing if you're paying attention. <laughs> Debbie, you get an A. <laughs> I flunk, and the rest of you are somewhere in between. So I... <laughs>
<laughs> a reading, <laughs> right, from Isaiah 9. Never, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning and will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. For to us, a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And so may it be. Years ago, a professor of religion in a small college taught a survey course in religion that every freshman was required to take. As with so many required intro courses, few students took it seriously. The professor, whose name was Dr. Douglas, was a devout Christian and wanted to help his students understand the truth of the gospel. One year, he had one student named Steve who was very serious about his Christian faith and was planning to go into the ministry, and he appreciated the professor's approach to the class. Near the end of the semester, the professor asked if Steve would stay after class. Knowing that Steve was an athlete, the professor asked him how many push-ups he could do. Steve told him he did about 200 every night. Like me, just like, no. <laughs> I'm just seeing if you're awake now. Dr. Douglas said, do you think you could do 300? Steve answered, I don't know. I've never done 300 at a time, but I think I could probably do 300. Dr. Douglas said, that's great. I'm wondering if you could help me out with something I wanted to do in class on Friday. After he explained his plan, Steve agreed to be a part of it. On Friday, the professor came in with this huge box of donuts enough for the whole class and every kind you could imagine, just they all looked fantastic. <clears throat> for many of the students, this was their last class of the day before their weekend started and they were all in a good mood. And when they saw the donuts, it was like getting a head start on the weekend. Dr. Douglas picked up the box and walked to the first woman in the first row and asked her if she wanted a donut. She smiled and said yes, and then the professor turned to Steve and said, Steve, would you do 10 push-ups so that Cynthia can have a donut? And he said, sure. And he dropped to the floor and he did 10 quick push-ups. And Dr. Douglas put a donut on the woman's desk. The students were obviously puzzled by this strange exchange, but they went along to see what was gonna happen. And there were donuts, you know, so. So then Dr. Douglas offered the next student a donut, and he also said yes. And again, Steve, he asked Steve to do 10 push-ups so the young man could have a donut. And so it went. Every student, he asked them, and they said yes, and had Steve do 10 push-ups every time they wanted a donut. But when Dr. Douglas asked Scott if he wanted a donut, he said, well, can I do my own push-ups? And Dr. Douglas said, no, Steve has to do them. And Scott said, well, then I don't want one. And the prof shrugged and then turned and said, Steve, would you do 10 push-ups so Scott can have a donut he doesn't want? And Steve, sure. So he starts doing his push-ups. And uh, he goes, well, hey, I said I didn't want it. He goes, that's okay. I, you know, you don't have to eat it. You just, so they took the donut and he put it on Scott's desk. 
After a good number of students had, had uh, gotten donuts, Steve was starting to slow down. And instead of bounding up after every set, he just kind of stayed on the floor. He was visibly, you know, he was starting to glow a little bit. And uh, another student, Jenny, refused the donut. And Dr. Douglas again asked Steve, would you do 10 push-ups so Jenny can have a donut she doesn't want? He did, and Jenny was given the donut she didn't want. The students were starting to feel really uncomfortable. Most of the students were refusing the donuts, but Dr. Douglas continued to give, uh, them, give a donut to each student after Steve had done the 10 push-ups. He was starting to really struggle to get them done. It took him longer to get through each set and his arms were starting to shake with the effort. A few students from other classes wandered in to try to figure out what was going on standing along the side of the room. And Dr. Douglas realized now there were 34 students in the room and was afraid Steve might not be able to pull it off. When another student named Jason wandered in, students in the class yelled at him to stay out. But Steve lifted his head and said, no, let him, let him come. And the professor said, you know, if he comes in, you'll have to do another set of push-ups for him. He said, yeah, I'll do them. Give him a donut. With great effort, Steve did 10 push-ups for everyone in that room to have a donut, whether they wanted it or not. After he very slowly finished that last push-up, with the understanding he accomplished everything required of him, his arms buckled underneath him and he continued to lie on the floor, breathing heavily for several minutes. He had just done 350 push-ups. And the students started asking Dr. Douglas, several of them quite angrily, what this had all been about. And he said, when I decided to have a party the last day of class, I looked at my grade book. Steve is the only student with a perfect grade. Everyone else has failed a test, skipped classes, many of you very often, or offered me inferior work. In one way or another, you've all fallen short of what you were supposed to do in this class. Steve told me that when a player messes up in football practice, he has to do push-ups. I thought I could use that to show you something about what God has done for each of us. Think of the donuts as the reward you would have gotten if you'd done everything perfectly in this class. And push-ups are the price you pay for goofing up or, or not doing all the things you should have. Well, the only one who deserved a donut without doing any push-ups was Steve. Like Jesus, Steve was willing to make a sacrifice in order to give you a free gift. He didn't have to do any push-ups to get a donut, but he did the ones that you were supposed to do. Some of you, probably most of you, would have been able to do 10 push-ups yourself. You could have paid the price yourself for messing up this semester and earned your own donut. But when it comes to messing up with God, not one of us is able to pay the price to make up for our own behavior. So the only way to be reunited with God is for someone else to pay the price. For someone to make things right who didn't participate in messing things up. And there's only one person who's never sinned, who's never hurt people, never done wrong. And that's Jesus. He was the only one who could restore us to a relationship with God. And so it was that our Savior Jesus Christ on the cross pled to the Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit with the understanding that he had done everything that was required of him. He yielded up his life in order to give us life. Some of us don't really want to acknowledge that our thoughts and our attitudes and behaviors have separated us from God, separated us from people, hurt others. And we think we have it in ourselves to do our own push-ups, but we underestimate the power sin has in our lives and overestimate our own goodness. And so we leave that beautiful donut on the table it was bought and paid for, and it was given to you freely. But the gift isn't received always. The professor had told his class, my wish is that you might understand 
and fully comprehend all the riches of grace and mercy that have been given to you through the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for us all, now and forever. Whether or not we choose to accept his gift, the price has been paid. Wouldn't it be unwise and ungrateful to leave it lying on the table? This baby in the manger, whose birth we celebrate tonight, came to make a way for you to know God's love. He came to offer grace, which means unmerited or unearned favor. He didn't come to judge, but to free you from judgment. He didn't come to burden you, but to unburden you. He came to give you donuts, metaphorically speaking. He came to invite you to the greatest party that has ever been or will ever be. He came because he loves you and he invites you into his family forever. Don't leave it on the table. It's my prayer that you would know the fullness of God's love this Christmas, that joy to the world would be the theme of your life tonight and forever. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray whether it's the first time or the hundredth time that we each would offer our hearts to you. Sometimes, sometimes the church and religious people have been guilty of making people feel like they just, you just want to extract a price out of them, but you're the one who gave because of love. I pray that each person would know that in the depths of their being. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. So we are going to uh, head down to Crane Hall. Um, if you would give me a second to get down, because I'm going to be the one lighting candles. And... Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so, I will. <laughs> so.